Hello, students of statics. This is Dr. Dan Baker. And in today's lecture, we are going to talk about frames and machines. Now, frames and machines are the last topic we'll cover in our equilibrium of structures module. And so we've been looking at all two force member systems, right? All trusses we defined as two force members. And so we're going to take a departure from that as we get into frames and machines. And actually, frames and machines we treat much more like the single rigid bodies we looked at in chapter five than we treat as the two force systems that we've looked at so far here in our chapter six equilibrium of structures. So let's make a little table to talk about the differences between these various types of equilibrium. This is going to be a three column table and make it most of the width of my page here. So talking about two dimensional equilibrium and then two dimensional trusses We've been covering the last few videos, and then now two-dimensional frames and machines. Shift things over just a touch to get a little more balance here in my table. And so for 2D equilibrium, we had one single body, and that body was subject to multiple forces and possibly also couples. We tend to call these commonly multi-force body. Okay, one single multi-force body. In 2D trusses, we had many two-force bodies. And then for frames and machines, we are going to have multiple um, two force and or multi force bodies. Okay, the key thing here is that we need at least one, so greater than one, greater than or equal to one multi-force body in order to create a frame and machine system. Of course, if we had all two force bodies, we could treat it just like a truss. Okay, so the next row here, we're gonna talk about what kind of free body diagram we create. So we created here a free body diagram of the body. For 2D trusses, we created either free body diagram of joints, or we also did a free body diagram of sections. Okay, both of these techniques, both joints and sections, only work if 100% of your system is two force bodies. What we'll see is that if we have multi-force bodies in the system, we need to create free body diagrams in this case, because frames and machines have more than one body, free body diagrams of bodies. Okay, so this parallelism between multi-force and free body diagram of the body here again, multi-force free body diagram of the body, only when we have all two force bodies, which is true of trusses, can we do method of joints or method of sections? And the last row of this table, let's just talk here briefly about equations and unknowns. For a single body, we know we had three equations. That we could solve for three unknowns. It would permit me just to abbreviation there of unknown U and K. For 2D trusses, if we did method of joints, we had, we summed our forces at each joint. And then for frames and machines, because these act more like our um, single multi-force bodies, we are going to have three times the number of free body diagrams are going to be our number of equations. And therefore we can solve for three times the free body diagrams number of unknowns. Okay, so three times our FBDs um, unknowns. 
Okay, so the techniques we use fundamentally in frames and machines are much more similar to what we did in chapter five than we have to anything we did in chapter six. The reason they lie here in chapter six is that in chapter five, we only dealt with single body systems. In chapter six, we're dealing with multi-body systems. Okay, let's take a look at what this looks like. So if we have this stool and we want to create a system of free body diagrams, what we'll do is we will isolate each one of these pieces. Okay, this is going to be leg um, E, C, B. Let's draw over here the other leg. So this is going to be D, C, A. Here is that connecting member between them. All right, so this is A, B. And let's draw the seat top up here. And this is point E and point D. Now, noting that there is only one single applied force in this entire system, this entire, now often we would call this a frame, mainly because it's not designed to move, it's not designed to have any motion, it's just going to designed to be static. But once again, both frames and machines will evaluate exactly the same way. The key point here with frames and machines is that when we created a single free body diagram, we knew that we could assume any direction we wanted for its um, its reaction forces. Now here, we're going to have reaction forces. Let me get these listed. So I'd have a normal force down here at A. So call this N sub A. I'd have another normal force pushing up here at B, N sub B. So those would be my reactions. And then I'm also going to have interaction forces that are basically happening between bodies. Right, so if we have interaction forces between bodies, let's go ahead and assume here at C, I have a horizontal force CX, a vertical force here CY. Okay, so here is the key thing with frames and machines, the probably most important detail. Uh, and that important detail is that when I transfer these forces from C on the body over here to C on the body over here, I need to transfer them equal and opposite. Okay, so equal and opposite means that CX on this other body needs to be going to the left because that's CX going to the right, and then CY needs to go down. Okay, quite honestly, that's probably one of the main challenging parts um, here to frames and machines. Otherwise, there are a lot of algebra. Okay, let me go ahead. I, I realize I put these point forces or these points here a little too low. Move those up. Sorry about that. Use your eraser, so A and B. We'll leave those normal forces down at the bottom. Actually, let's just go with, call these N1 and N2, just so we don't um, confuse them with the forces going on at A and B, okay? And so now looking at AB, AB is pinned on both ends. There was nothing mentioned in this problem about the weight or mass of AB. Therefore, AB is a, hopefully you said two force member. So if I assume that AB is in tension, I could say that this is the force A, uh, this here is the force B. Let's go ahead and put some sub X's on there, AX and BX. So purely in tension. And then I get the same pulling force here in tension on A and a pulling force over here on B. All right, now I come up to E and D. Now, once again, I can assume any direction I want as long as I haven't identified these yet. So let's call this DX, DY. Coming over here to D, equal and opposite. DY needs to come down. DX needs to go to the left. Let's go with EX coming back in this direction. And we'll go with it going upwards here for EY. And so here we have uh, equal and opposite, uh, EX, EY, okay? So instead of having just one free body diagram, we now have created, in this case, four free body diagrams. Let's talk a little bit more about what kind of free body diagrams these are. This is a two-force member, 
with a two-force member, we get all of one equation, right? All, the only equation we end up with for a two-force member is that AX equals BX. That's it. If you sum moments, if you sum forces in the y direction, you don't get any additional information. So essentially for a two-force member, you get one equation. For a multi-force body, you end up with three equations. Okay, so here, obviously ECB has all, so all sorts of forces applied to it. This is a multi-force. So we'll have three equations here, three equations over here for ACD, and then also ED is another multi-force member. So there are three equations available there. Okay, it's always worthwhile thinking about, do my equations match the number of my unknowns? So I have a total of 10 equations available, three times three plus one. Now let's go through and count our number of unknowns. Okay, N1's an unknown, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Now I don't wanna double count any of these, okay? Seven, eight, I already counted EX, CX, CY, nine, and 10. Okay, noting I didn't double count basically the forces that were on the connecting body. I just wanted to get an arithmetic count of equations equals unknowns. So we have 10 equations is equal to 10 unknowns. And so that gives me enough information to be able to solve this problem. Okay, so that's always a good thing to check. Just like for single bodies, you checked if you had three or fewer unknowns. Now we take a look here and we look at three equations for multi-force bodies, two equations fundamentally for two-force bodies, sorry, one equation for a two-force body, two equations for a concurrent force body, right? Remember that if we had a situation, say on this seat up here, that we ended up with the force coming in here, and maybe there's a couple of two-force members instead of these multi-force members attached, right? So if all these forces were intersecting at one single point, we call that a concurrent force system. It, it acts just like a particle. And basically with that, we could sum forces in the X, sum forces in the Y. So we'd have two equations um, with a concurrent force body. Right. And again, we treated particles as concurrent force bodies. So one other thing I wanted to talk about in the context of frames and machines is looking at rigid versus non-rigid systems. Okay, so if we look at a rigid system, fundamentally a rigid system um, stays rigid when removed from its supports. So obviously to contrast that with a non-rigid system, leave a little bit of space there, I'm going to put some drawings in between. And in a non-rigid system, we end up with, uh, it can, can change shape when removed from supports. You'll see in some textbooks, this is actually the definitions they end up using for frames and machines. Again, I don't get really heavily into those definitions because we treat them all generally the same way. But for a rigid system, let's say it looks like the following. So we have three members Now this may look like a truss because these three members are in a triangle but you're gonna see from the loading that these cannot be two force members. And so let's say we have one force applied over here on this side. Let's say that we have a couple applied here. Now let's go with a pin here on the lower left and a roller on the lower right. 
So we'll call this A, B, C. Now, noting that AC does turn out to be a two-force member, and then AB and BC are both multi-force members. Okay, so you can't have a mix of these two-force and multi-force members. And so we certainly can explode this into the three free body diagrams and work at solving our reactions. So AX, AY, and CY. And we could also find the interaction forces at A, B, and C. Now, I think the best way to solve these problems if they are rigid is just to keep them rigid for one more step before you start solving for everything. That's to leave the entire triangle as a rigid body, only leaving the reaction forces. Sorry, I labeled, flipped these labels here. It doesn't technically matter for my um, example, but AX, AY, and CY, here's my applied forces still of F and this couple, that moment applied right here. And then basically you can solve for this one, this one, and this one, right? AX, AY, and CY as a single rigid body, then break it into pieces and solve for the interaction forces. Okay, so if it's rigid, I'll put often easiest. And this really just gets down to like minimizing your unknowns on each free body diagram as we saw here above. We can end up with a whole bunch of unknowns on these bodies. And so getting rid of some of those early on can help us out. And so one would be to draw your FBD of the rigid body. And solve for reactions. And then two, I'm going to say to explode, it's very non-scientific, kind of a scientific term, but break into multiple pieces, adding all of the interaction forces. So explode and find these interaction forces. So as an example of a non-rigid system, we'll actually create a system that looks very similar to our system above with just kind of one main difference. So still two rigid members. Let's go with a pin down here. Now we're gonna label this one, give it a different name, call it point D and E, and we'll go with G. Now in order for this system which is non-rigid, if you removed it from that support at D and we'll put a support over here at G, what we'd see is that we could flex those arms back and forth. They're basically, they're pinned at E. But in order for it to be a, a system that when it's attached to its reactions is still going to be a rigid system, right? We're not, we, we can't work dynamics problems yet. We need to have a pin over here at G as well. And so basically what we're doing here is that we're substituting in one additional reaction force and one fewer internal member force, okay? Now let's go ahead and add the same applied forces, so a couple and an external force. So in this situation, which is non-rigid, right? You remove it from D and G and you can bend it back and forth rotating around point E, the only option and this isn't like this isn't like in rigid system where you say, ah, do one or the other. Like this is the only way you can solve these problems. So we want to one to explode into separate free body diagrams, and then kind of simultaneously solve for reactions. and interaction forces. Now you also technically could have interaction couples. In this case, we have pins. So just to remind us here, as we talk about reactions, our reactions are gonna happen here at G and D. Our interactions are gonna happen up here at E. 
okay? So just a little bit different definition, but interaction between bodies, reactions between bodies and basically the external world. All right, so if we drew these free body diagrams, they'd look like the following. There is our two members. Let's go ahead and add these external loads, M, F. Let's um, make this free body diagram official with a axis system, X and Y. We have a pin down here at D, so DX and DY. I have a pin at G, GX, GY. And then I get my interaction force up here at E. I'm going to zoom to the right. So EX will go upwards, EY. And then this comes back to Newton's third law, right? Newton's third law tells us that for every action, we have an equal and opposite reaction. And so the reaction here between these bodies, EY goes down, EX goes to the left, right? Equal and opposite opposite and again if i want to keep with this highlighting here are my reaction forces and then my interaction are up here at e now for this case we have two multi-force bodies and we have three equations of equilibrium for each one of these so three plus three is six and we could, could go through and count the number of unknowns i'll do it with the underline this time so dx one two three four, five, and six. Okay, now each one of these bodies has four unknowns. And so there's no way on this problem you could solve for all of those values before you move on to the next. But you now have a system of six equations, six unknowns. Again, this is one of the cases where a matrix solution using linear algebra may become beneficial if you're not able to fairly easily do substitution and work through the equations and unknowns. The last topic I wanted to hit before moving on is looking at pulleys in machines and kind of seeing how they manifest themselves. And so let's do this with a little case study. So let's say that we have a non-moving little part of a ceiling up here and off that ceiling is a pin. Now here's our rigid body we're gonna take a look at. Okay, so there's the rigid body. Let's go ahead and put a frictionless pulley mounted to this upper left corner. Another frictionless pulley here on the lower left corner. Let's say that we have one more piece of non-moving wall down here. Okay, so our cable, let's say runs horizontal around that pulley, around this pulley, and maybe over an angle to attach to the wall. And just to give us some kind of an applied load, let's go with a couple. Okay, so we have a couple applied to this body. Let's go with point names of D, E, and F. Okay, so I have a rigid body, D, E, F. I have applied couple C. I have some frictionless pulleys at E and F and a cable which is wrapped around those frictionless pulleys. Okay, there's two different ways I could create a free body diagram system for this body. One which takes a whole bunch of effort and one which is a little bit more straightforward. So this is the long option. And the long option is to create free body diagrams both of the body and of each one of these pulleys. All right, so the body, let's go ahead, we had this applied couple. We have a pin at A, AX, AY. Now I have also a pin connecting the pulley at E to the body over here. So let's go with the forces on the body horizontal and vertical, equal and opposite over here, downwards. Now, I also fundamentally, as I was drawing this system, I cut away, not only away from the body, I also cut the cable, right? So if I cut the cable, 
I need to expose the forces that were in that cable, those tension forces. I'm going to do the same thing down here at F. So Fx, Fy, equal and opposite, Fx, downwards, Fy. Tension forces, once again, cutting away the cable. Move my, sorry, my Fx label there. I wrote over the top of it, and then at an angle here, T. Okay, so I have these three separate free body diagrams, a whole bunch of unknowns. But one thing you can notice, especially if we zoom into the free body diagram up here at the pulley at E, is that if I sum my forces in the X and I sum my forces in the Y, I'm fundamentally going to find that the tension forces applied are going to be exactly equal to those pin force components. Okay, so another way that we can say this in words is that we can say that pulleys transfer cable tension directly to the pin. Okay, and I should add here also, beyond just um, being pulleys, these are frictionless plus massless. So if there is any kind of friction at the pin, rotational friction, or if there's any kind of mass, right, that this pulley would have a weight, these, um, this justification no longer applies. Okay, so let's go from the long option to the short option. So in the short option, we're going to assume that those pin forces, or excuse me, the tension forces are going to apply right to the pin. So we still need some pin forces over here, AX and AY at A. We still have an applied couple here, C. But now, at point E, I'm basically just going to draw the tension forces that are being transferred through that pin. So it looks like this. T comes down, T goes to the right. Okay, once again, you're essentially working through this other free body diagram in order to get that equality. And to do the same thing here at point F, we have a tension force going up and a tension force coming down at the same angle. Right, the same angle that was here, call that angle theta. We're going to find that's the same angle here for this other tension force. So fundamentally on this problem, this T and this T would cancel, and that um, the only tensions you're really dealing with are those that are cutting this body away from those um, the ceiling and wall. And so I typically will choose this option right here, and I'm totally fine if you basically understand the justification for that rule, and then you can apply that. So really what it did is it took a frame and machine problem with multiple bodies, and in this case, reduced it to one single um, rigid body. Now, after you end up with your free body diagrams, again, go through and solve for your um, equations of equilibrium. Um, one thing that makes the graders very happy is if you label your free body diagrams. Okay, so in this case, maybe we call this A, B, and C, or you can label them according to the body. So it could be um, A, E, F, and, and pulley at E, or whatever else. But as you get down to your equations, say, hey, for free body diagram A, I'm going to sum my forces in the x equals 0, sum my forces in the y equals 0. Then as I get to free body diagram B, I have some different equations, summing forces in the x equals 0, etc. Okay, but provide some delineation between those so that we, as we're grading, and also you as you're reviewing problems later that you've already completed, can tell which equations come from which free body diagrams. Okay, so again, make sure that your labels are unique. Any kind of unique force or couple deserves its own unique label.
All right, hopefully that was a helpful overview of frames and machines. Now you can apply all of your knowledge to solving these equilibrium systems to solving frame and machine problems.